actually happened is this point in 10 minutes for a further 15 minutes, the three consultants would appear to have continued with their attempts to intubate to the exclusion of any other option. And that at the end of that 15 minutes, we're now 25 minutes into the whole procedure, they eventually get Elaine's oxygenation to 90%, but she's actually been at 40% or lower for a total now for over 20 minutes. Can we get above 90? Nope, she won't go up. No, you got 90 though, that's better. I don't think we should carry on with the operation. No, I agree, I think we should have done it at this stage. Okay. The airway itself is not secure though, and so they fiddle around a bit more, and in fact her oxygenation falls again below 90% for a further 10 minutes. And finally, by the time we're 35 minutes in, they seem to make the decision that the best thing is just to let her wake up naturally. Let's wheel her back, quick as we can. And they transfer her to the recovery room. She lays there for an hour and a half, and of course, she never wakes up. Based on the evidence from the inquest and from Professor Harmer's report, the lead anaesthetist, if I can call him that, in his own words, lost control. There was a question mark in the inquest about who people felt was in charge at different points. There was certainly a loss of awareness, an awareness of time but also an awareness of the seriousness of the situation. If you like, the awareness of what was happening wasn't shared by each of the consultants. There was certainly a, a breakdown in the decision-making processes, and it would appear that the communication processes dried up amongst the consultants. The story with the nurses is very different. The nurses were generally aware of what was happening and what needed to happen. When I said to you that uh, six to eight minutes in, those three nurses arrived, one of them asked her colleague to go and fetch the tracheostomy set. There was already a quick tracheo kit in theatre. She went out, she collected the tracheostomy set, she came back in and she announced to the consultants that the tracheostomy set was available and there was no response. One of the other nurses um, who walked in immediately saw Elaine's colour, immediately saw the vital signs and walked out again to phone intensive care. She phoned to check that her bed was immediately available. She came back in and she announced to the three consultants that her bed was available in intensive care. And in her own words, they looked at her as if to say, what's wrong? You're overreacting. She actually walked out and cancelled that bed. At the inquest, two of the four nurses uh, stated that they knew exactly what needed to happen, uh, but again, to quote from the inquest, didn't know how to broach the subject. We have a, a breakdown of leadership of situational awareness, of prioritisation, of decision making, of communication and of assertiveness. And, and these same factors, these same human factors, ironically are present in 75% of aviation accidents. Uh, and really, since then, I've been trying to understand why in aviation we, we train and to, to understand about human factors and it's an integral part of how we design equipment and how we manage procedures and how we work day to day. It's part of our everyday language uh, but I'm trying to understand why that's not part of clinical practice. When we get out to the aircraft there's a lot of technical jobs that need to be performed. Uh, there's the usual security checks of an empty aircraft there's the safety checks, both of the outside, we have to do a walk around, making sure the systems are functioning and that uh, everything we require for flight is switched on or, or operating in the way it should. Having done all the preparation, got everything ready for flight, we then get together in a briefing. 
And that's really to make sure that we both know what we expect to happen, but more importantly, that we think through all the possibilities. Up to 100 knots, you'll consider stopping for any ECAM warning or caution. Above 100, you'll only consider stopping ECAM warning, engine failure, something you think is going to stop us flying. Three things to remind me of. With a positive climb, we'll get the gear up if appropriate. Remind me that Toga's available. Remind me that Autopilot's available. If it's not performance limiting, I propose to follow the SID. Uh, the only other exception to that is if we had some uncontrollable situation like a fire still burning when we get to S speed, in which case I'll pull that and it's suitable for a right hand visual back for 27 right today. Any questions on the emergencies? Okay, as far as the departure... It's an opening up of communication. Human factors tells us that actually we're all wrong no matter how good we are and we need people around us to help us. It's creating that open environment within your colleagues, being open to suggestions. If they put their hand up and say, excuse me, I'm not sure about this, it's not turning around and saying, actually, I'm the boss here. It's turning around and saying, tell me what your concern is. It's listening. Uh, and before you ask, by the way, what happened to the uh, people who were involved in my wife's incident, you will be pleased to know that they all returned to work eventually after the incident. And that is exactly what I wanted to happen. By being back in the workplace, they can spread those very personal lessons on to their colleagues. And all of them will be much better clinicians as a result of what happened, of that there's no doubt. The key message I would emphasise is that in aviation, we know 75% of accidents are caused by human factors. In healthcare, what's the statistic? Is it 75% as well? Is it 85%? Is it 55%? No one really knows. My argument is, though, that the actual statistic is irrelevant. If you accept common sense and look around you, that tells you a large proportion of accidents and incidents will be caused by human factors. The lessons from other industries are there, and they're equally applicable to healthcare. And if it is only 45%, that is an awful lot of lives that we could be saving. Let's wake up to human factors. Let's make a difference.